Now, we're not to answer the fool according to his folly. We're not to embrace his standard, his presuppositions. Otherwise, what? We would be like him. And so if somebody comes to you and they've got silly presuppositions, which we're going to represent here as such, and it's, for example, this person says, let's leave the Bible out of the discussion. Well, that's a silly presupposition. Why would we leave the Bible, the inerrant word of God, out of any discussion, especially one that deals with origins? That doesn't make sense. Let's leave the Bible out of the discussion. If you say, yeah, okay, we can leave the Bible out of the discussion, well, then you've become like him. You've answered the fool according to his folly. You've embraced his presuppositions, and now you've become foolish too. Now where are you going to go? You've conceded what you're trying to prove. You're not going to go anywhere. So never buy into the presuppositions of the unbeliever. But then the next proverb says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. And that may sound like a contradiction, but it's not because the sense is different. Uh, we are not to answer the fool according to his folly in the sense of embracing his presuppositions, but we are to answer him according to his folly in the sense of showing where his presuppositions would go if hypothetically they were true. We're going to reflect back to him his own philosophy so that he can see how absurd it is and therefore cannot be wise in his own eyes. It's kind of like, I'm not going to live in your house. I'm just going to step inside for a few minutes, destroy all the furniture, and then leave. Okay? It's just a temporary uh, refutation of your worldview, an internal critique, which I mentioned earlier. So somebody comes to you and says, there are no absolutes. There are no absolutes. So you can argue with me, but you can't use absolutes because there, no, there are no absolutes. Now, you're not going to embrace that standard, don't answer according to his folly, but you are going to answer him according to his folly by reflecting that philosophy back to him and saying, well, actually, if there were no absolutes, you couldn't say there are no absolutes. You see how silly you're being? Okay? You're reflecting that philosophy back to him so he cannot be wise in his own eyes. He sees the absurdity of his own presuppositions. It's a great way of arguing, an irrefutable way of arguing, really. Don't embrace the presuppositions of the unbeliever. Never put on the suit. But do reflect it back to him so that he can see the absurdity of his own position. And let's take that, that uh, strategy now and apply it to the areas of knowledge that we've already talked about, logic and morality and science and so on. Suppose somebody says, I believe in naturalism. They're probably not going to be up, that upfront about it. You're going to have to listen and figure out their worldview. But it becomes clear they're a naturalist. And he says, show me logically how the earth could be 6,000 years old. You're, I hope you're mentally zooming in on two words, logic and naturalism, because we already saw those two things don't go well together, do they? If you're a naturalist, if nature's all that there is, you can't have universal and material invariant entities like laws of logic. And so now what we're going to do is use the don't answer answer strategy to expose the absurdity of this person's worldview. We're going to say, well, first of all, I don't accept your belief in naturalism. So I'm not even going to attempt to prove creation on your standard. But for the sake of argument, if naturalism were true, you couldn't prove anything because you, you can't have laws of logic if you're a naturalist. You see how powerful that strategy is? Because it goes right to the heart of the issue fast. How about this one? He's, he says, uh, you can't take the Bible seriously. It's full of contradictions. Ever heard people say that before? And we're inclined to say, well, show me one and I'll try and explain it to you. And it, 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 might be, it might be fitting to do that once or twice, but eventually you must get to the don't answer, answer strategy and say, well, first of all, I don't accept your claim that the Bible has contradictions. In my worldview, the Bible's the word of God. It can't have contradictions because God doesn't deny himself. But for the sake of argument, and here's a powerful question most Christians don't think to ask. For the sake of argument, why in your worldview would that be wrong? Oh, well, everybody knows contradictions are wrong. Well, I know contradictions are wrong because they're contrary to the nature of God. But my question is, how do you know that contradictions are always wrong? Why would you have a law of non-contradiction? Well, I've never seen a true contradiction. Well, I've never seen a total solar eclipse, but that doesn't mean they're impossible, right? How do you know that contradictions never happen? I know that because God's knowledge is universal, and therefore the fact that God does not deny himself tells me that there is a universal law of non-contradiction. But how do you know that? That's a question you won't be able to answer, I guarantee it. Some people say, well, it's wrong to teach creation in schools. You're lying to children. Think of the children. Don't teach creation. But, of course, lying implies a moral standard, doesn't it? And so this person is borrowing on the Christian worldview to argue against it. And we're going to point that out using the don't answer answer strategy. First of all, I don't accept that teaching creation is lying. I don't accept your claim, your standard. I believe creation is true, evolution is false. We're teaching them the truth in schools. But for the sake of argument, in your worldview, why would it be wrong to lie to children? Oh, well, everybody knows it's wrong to lie. Well, I know it's wrong to lie because it's contrary to God's nature. But how do you know it's wrong to lie? I mean, in an evolutionary universe, if, if children are just chemical accidents, why would it be wrong to lie to them, particularly if it benefits my survival value? That's what I want to know. It doesn't make sense. The Christian God is not good. He slaughters innocent children. Look at the God of the Old Testament going out and wiping out all those, 
all those uh, society, societies, genocide, and so on and so forth. Now, a lot of Christians find that tough to answer. But if you understand the principles that I've uh, covered today, this is easy because this person is assuming a standard of goodness when he says good and innocent, you see. And so he's borrowing on the Christian worldview to argue against it. And so my response would be like this. I would say, first of all, God is good and is the standard of goodness. That's in the Christian worldview. It doesn't even make sense to say that God isn't good. That's like saying Dr. Lyle isn't very Dr. Lyle-ish, right? <laughs> I'm as Dr. Lyle-ish as I can be because I'm fully Dr. Lyle. God is as good as he can be because he's fully God. God defines what good is. But for the sake of argument, apart from God, how can you determine what is good and who are innocent? And that he cannot do. That can't be done apart from the Christian worldview. If you understand this principle, you can take any argument that's waged against Christianity and show that the argument itself would not make sense unless Christianity is true, all the way back to the biblical creation. And you'll learn to see these inconsistencies that people come up with. And uh, I, you know, I think of Richard Dawkins, the guy that goes around preaching atheism, right? I mean, here's a man who is convinced that it's his purpose in life to convince people that there's no purpose in life. You see the inconsistency there? It just doesn't make sense. Secular worldviews always blow themselves up. And if you can see that, you're going to see how this guy is not going to be successful in destroying the, the Christian position. He's only going to destroy his own. If you understand that, you can agree with the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 1.20. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Indeed, he has. 1 Peter 3.15. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. That's the key. And always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. And if you, boy, if you understand this, you can give a powerful defense of the Christian worldview, an irrefutable defense of the Christian worldview, because any counterargument would have to use God's laws of logic, the science, which is a, possible because of God, God's upholding power, or some sense of morality. And so any argument against Christianity presupposes Christianity. It really does. And if you understand that, you've got a powerful defense of the faith. You, there will be no rational comeback. Can't guarantee the person will convert. That's not your job. As, a, as my... Um, as a, uh, my uh, teacher, really, Dr. Bonson, liked to put it, he said that it's not our job to open people's hearts. That's the Holy Spirit's prerogative. It's our job to close their mouths. That's what we do. <laughs> We're giving a defense of the faith. And if they convert, that's up to God. And uh, as we get better and better at this, and I guarantee you, it does not take long to get good at this. This may sound a little bit abstract or philosophical. It does not take long to learn this, really. It's, it's not difficult. And you will be able to slice and dice your opponent. I guarantee it. But... Uh, and as you do that, it's all the more important that you remember the last part of this verse with meekness and fear, with gentleness and respect. I've been kind of blunt in the answers I've given because they're hypothetical, and I want you to get the point. But you know that you need to temper it with uh, politeness, never at the expense of truth, but you do want to be gracious in the way that you answer because critics are made in the image of God too. And so we need to show them the proper respect. The key to defending the faith is to stand on the authority of the Word of God and point out to the unbeliever that he is also standing on the authority of God. He's relying upon God's principles to argue against God. It's not difficult to get this stuff. I've been able to teach this to teenagers in three days, and they got it because I gave them a test afterwards, and they did very well on it. One of them got a perfect score. So this is not, and I'm, I don't give easy tests. So this is, uh, this is not difficult to learn, but I have written a book on this topic, which I'd encourage you to get, The Ultimate Proof of Creation. And it's a very different way of, of thinking about apologetics. I admit that, but I think that's good. I think it's a very powerful way, and I have yet to lose a debate once I, when, when I've used this particular method, when I've stood on the authority of God's Word, yeah, because God knows how to argue. Who can contend with the Almighty, right? If you master this method, you'll not lose an origins debate, if you master the method. Learn to think like Christ, and you will have a very, very effective apologetic.